All right, everyone. Hello. Make, make sure everything is working. I know we've got a lot of people logging in right now. Forgive me for looking away. I've got two screens. I'm just checking sort of my technical dashboard before we formally get started here. Uh, just a reminder, everyone, this is being recorded, will be available. All right. Greetings. Hello. I am Eric Glazer, your host and moderator today. This is the Population Health Executive Roundtable. And boy, do we have a great program planned for you today. Uh, today's topic is how to increase uh, the impact of social determinants in value-based care. You are about to meet five exceptional leaders in health who will be offering their, their insights and experience to all of you in the hope that you could take their ideas and what's working at their organizations back to your hospital, your ACO, your health plan, et cetera. I only regret we only have an hour for the session today. I wish we could be speaking to these folks all day. They're exceptional and deserve to be uh, interviewed for an hour or more by themselves. Uh, so you could blame our producer, Sherry Kales, for putting together too good of a panel. Uh, our timing today will be tight. Uh, we've been running the round table here for about five years and today may actually be the most uh, attended. So I know some of you uh, must be joining us for the first time. And I ask you the favor of checking out sharedpurposeconnect.com to learn a bit more about us because I'm going to bypass the majority of my regular introduction in order to give our roundtable experts as much time as possible. I'd like you to know one thing about us though. Uh, we produce these sessions every month, typically the, the last Thursday of, of the month. Next month is actually March 21st. I think it's the third Thursday. So you can mark your calendar for that. Uh, and it's gonna be at one o'clock. So next month's an aberration, but we do this every month, typically on the last Thursday. And our whole purpose is to highlight the positive deviance in healthcare, the bright spots. I trust our regulars would say that this is not your typical webinar, and that's why we've become so popular over the years. Our mission is to find leaders like the five folks in front of you today to share successes so you could bring them to your organizations because that is the most effective, cost-effective strategy to improving healthcare in our lifetime. And with that said, we're able to provide this programming to you every month uh, because of the incredible support all of you provide us by attending. Uh, I know we don't charge for registration, but your attendance does enable us uh, to hand select corporations to, to sponsor our programming. Uh, and put another way, uh, we're able to run these through sponsorships, but have the luxury of being selective with who we partner with and make sure that we're very careful in aligning our sponsorship expertise to the content that we're delivering each month. So our topic today is closely tied to the very reason uh, that I started this series. Uh, I cannot stand when smart business leaders in healthcare sit in a board or conference room and month over month and year over year talk about the same challenges with the same ho-hum, less than effective solutions and really think anything's gonna change for the better. We tend to have a big echo chamber in our industry and we need to look on the outside of our lane when thinking about things like patient, and I prefer to call it consumer, engagement. So if you've uh, ever talked to the most sophisticated agencies on Madison Avenue, the ones that represent the biggest consumer brands like Nike, Coke, Marriott, Microsoft, uh, they take a much more sophisticated approach than we do in healthcare in market consumers in understanding the consumer's values well enough that they truly influence behavioral change in a way that benefits the brand that they represent. We in healthcare, we're just not that sophisticated in marketing the patients who are at the highest risk of costing us the most money. Until, until now, uh, we are extremely fortunate to have convinced uh, Revel Health to provide us with their expertise today. Uh, so they're represented on our panel. Uh, they, in brief, focus on understanding people. They know the populations you struggle with, like Medicare Advantage and Medicaid, isn't about population health, but it's about actually the individual. And this is the most important point I wanna make. The approach, uh, they approach healthcare differently uh, by understanding the values and the belief systems uh, 
of an individual so they can create a personalized plan, a personalized approach to driving positive behavioral change. Uh, it's really a fresh way of thinking about engagement and social determinants of health. So check them out at revel-health.com. We'll include that in the show notes, but it's R-E-V-E-L dash health.com. Uh, Sarah Ratner, who I'm going to introduce with our other experts in a moment, is representing Rebel Health. And like our other panel, she's here to share ideas and experiences. She's not going to be the salesperson. She's not a salesperson. Uh, but I am as the host of this session. I could unapologetically tell you a little bit about more about Rebel Health later on in our session and endorse them as being an outside-of-the-box thinker in this domain. So definitely want to check them out. Uh, finally, uh, I, I'd like you to do me one solid. Uh, turn off your phones or put them on Do Not Disturb. Shut down the email. We're going to be jam-packed with information. You should take good notes. Yes, this will be recorded, but this will fly. There's a lot of great content. We've met with all of our panels ahead of time. I can tell you this is going to be great. Uh, and I'd also like at the 55 minute mark for you to put on your email and check out uh, an email we'll be sending you with our survey. I know our regulars uh, think I'm a pain about this, but it's the only thing I ask of you is to take the survey and provide us with feedback. Five years of data tell us that it takes the average respondent just about two and a half minutes to complete this multiple choice feedback form. Uh, it is how we drive our programming. It's how we grow. It's why we're doing today's session, because the last two months you asked for this topic. So help us help you take the survey. All right. Believe me, each of these folks that I'm about to introduce are so impressive. Uh, but in the interest of time, I had to reduce the versions of their bio. This should give you a sense of the value you're about to receive. So in alphabetical order, by first name, our first panelist, uh, is is Amy? Oh God, Amy! I'm sorry, Amy Sean. Sean. Amy Sean. She's. I blew that. We just went over that. She's the executive director of Urban Health Initiatives at Health at Case Western Reserve School of Medicine. Uh, she has recently completed the Childhood Obesity Prevention Mission Project, which she co-directed as part of the non-for-profit uh, Altarium Institute in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, prior to coming to Case Western, she was instrumental in the establishment of three different centers at the University of Michigan focused on clinical research, ethical issues in the life sciences, and on improving educational outcomes for disadvantaged youth. Uh, also has worked at the NIH on maternal infant HIV transmission, HIV prevention studies, and cancer genetics, has her master's in public health from the University of Michigan and her doctorate from John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Incidentally, the only person in today's session without a doctorate is yours truly. Um, I typically am the least educated and intelligent uh, on the calls. Um, our, our next uh, our next panelist uh, from the West Coast is Gina Antenarelli. She is the Vice President, Office of Population Health and Accountable Care at the University of California, San Francisco Health. She crafts and implements uh, innovative programs and tools to improve care for the UCSF uh, patients and advance overall population health. She supports UCSF Health, the Healthcare Network, and the Medical Center, along with seven regional entities. She started her career uh, as a critical care registered nurse before getting her doctorate in health policy. So Gina, welcome. Thank you for getting up early for us. Our next panelist is Renee McLaughlin. Uh, she's formerly a practicing general and vascular surgeon. She serves now as the national medical director uh, at value-based relationships at Cigna. She's been there, I think, since 2005. She leads a team now focused on design, implementation, and management of collaborative partnerships with healthcare providers. She was recently appointed to the Healthcare Payment Learning and Action Guiding Committee for CMS. Uh, uh, she has also served our country in the U.S. Army during the first Gulf War and was Award of the National Defense Medal. So thank you for your service, Renee. And if that's not enough, she's currently completing her MBA at the University of Tennessee Chattanooga. Our next panelist is Sarah Ratner, who helps lead, gov lead government programs for Rebel Health. Uh, prior to Rebel, she was the SVP of Corporate Systems and Compliance at Redbrook Health. And prior to that, the GC of v and VP of Strategic Partnerships and Human Resources at CVS Caremark, where she grew the Minute Clinic division from 80 to 560 clinics. She also serves on the board of a VC-funded company called Proxima Health has her JD from St. Louis University graduating summa cum laude. 
And last and certainly not least is Zev Newworth. He is the Senior Medical Director of Population Health at HEM Health in North Carolina. He focuses on Medicare Shared Savings, Medicare Advantage, Medicaid Managed Care, uh, employee health, post-acute care, and chronic complex chronic care and disparities in health. In addition to his role at Atrium, he also hosts a popular podcast. You can check it out. It's called Creating a New Healthcare, and that's on iTunes and Google Play. We'll try to include that in the show notes. Uh, so Sherry, make a note of that. Uh, he also is coming out with a new book in April. It's called Reframing Healthcare, A Roadmap for Creating Disruptive Change. So we'll also include that in the show notes. And that's a book that provides step-by-step -step guides for healthcare leadership teams who are trying to improve healthcare at an improved uh, and accelerated pace. So thank you all for joining us. I'm going to jump right into it. I want to talk about the common misunderstandings around social determinants of health. And by the way, those of you in the audience, I know you submitted questions coming into this. Uh, we grouped them together and we are able to address probably about a third of them. I'll make sure you know when we're coming into an, a, an attendee question, but we try to make this as customer friendly as possible. So first question, common misunderstandings around the social determinants of health. Gina, why don't you take this first? Sure, um, hi everybody. Um, so I think one of the common misconceptions is that social determinants is completely aligned with socioeconomic status, but it is much broader than that. So the social encompasses um, cultural, geography, um, the way that people interact and engage, social literacy. And I think the challenge and uh, that we um, are currently facing is the fact that we, uh, we know that when we interact with patients, but it's it's really difficult for us to quantify and uh, measure that. And we're in our early attempts to do that. So that would be my first um, out of the gate um, assessment of, of where okay. people sometimes um, have misunderstandings about social determinants. Zev, how about a physician perspective? Yeah, thanks for asking. You know, I think the challenge with the social determinants health is actually almost a marketing one. We know from the literature that well over 50% of the uh, outcomes of our health are not determined by the healthcare industry. So they have nothing to do with clinical care. And, uh, and so this has been verified for years. It's not new at all. The, the challenge is that uh, most of us in healthcare, most physicians uh, aren't aware of that, aren't aware of that literature. And, and again, it's not surprising, you spend your entire career focused on getting good at clinical care. And it, it takes a career um, to be good, whether you're a physician or surgeon, uh, or even an executive administrator in healthcare, it's very complicated and, and it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort and there's very little time for anything else. So it's not surprising that the vast majority of administrators and physicians are just not aware of, uh, of this literature and of the importance of the social determinants of health um, in determining both the cost of outcomes as, as well as the quality of outcomes. What, what, um, what are you doing about that? Do you, do you guys have a play on how to improve that, how to get the doctors sort of better thinking around it? Well, for sure, we, we actually have an entire division that is now devoted to community health. We have actually an entire division devoted to population health. Uh, we have a clinical integration network that focuses on it. And so what we're doing is getting physician leaders and administrators together uh, to begin to actually work on solving those problems. And we're acting as sort of a convener in the community. And so um, it is, uh, I would say it's a, a slow journey. Again, we know, and, and Dr. McLaughlin, I'm sure is very familiar with this, that it takes about 15 years before an evidence-based finding actually makes it its way into mainstream healthcare. So we've been working on social determinants of health for far less than 15 years, really, within healthcare. So we've got a little bit of time, but um, we have a lot of effort underway to try to both educate um, our physicians, our uh, staff, as well as the community around us. Because it, it's really startling. You know, the, there's this phrase that um, our zip code actually has a bigger impact on our health than our genetic code. And, um, and again, those are the facts. It's just not very well known. Are you doing anything with um, just embedding fo forced forms in the EMR to force doctors to be thinking about it? Is there any 
Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't characterize it as forcing. I would say, um, you know, we're really trying to make it easy to do the right thing. And so one of the things we've done, and I know others around the country are also doing very, something very similar, is we've taken a, uh, a standardized survey. We were actually using something called the prepare survey. It's about 50 or so questions. We pared it down to about 10 questions. And they ask things like, you know, do you have enough money to afford food? Do you have appropriate housing? Do you have transportation? Can you afford your medications? Uh, are, are you living in a safe place? Uh, housing. So very, very basic questions. We've embedded this into our electronic medical record system. Now, these are standardized questions, so we didn't make them up. And in fact, they're actually consistent with what the state is requiring from a Medicaid managed care perspective. So we're, we're actually collaborating with the state of North Carolina on this. But they're in our electronic medical record system. And what it does is it makes it easy for every physician, every nurse, every care manager to ask the same exact questions and to get it into the electronic medical record system so that everyone who's trying to take care of the patient um, can, can a have access to this information. And so, uh, and, and again, we're not, we're not um, forcing anyone to use it. In fact, people use it in different ways. So in some offices, the nurses are doing the questions. In some offices, the physicians are doing them. In some offices, it's the front staff. Uh, in some offices, actually, we we give the patient a, a paper form and say, you fill it out and then we'll put it into the electronic medical record system for you. Great. So let's, I'm going to stay with the same question. I'm going to shift gears away from the physician, maybe into just macro government drivers and bring Sarah in. Sarah, you know, from where you sit, what are some of the most common misunderstandings around SDOH? Some of what uh, may be overlooked in all of this is the role that the government is playing on social determinants of health. Um, the government has started to recognize more and more the role of non-healthcare factors that play into health outcomes. And states are requiring plans and providers to focus on this. You see it at the national level with the 2016 regulations that CMS proposed requiring these assessments within the first 90 days of enrollment. Um, and states are, are focusing on this greatly. I know we don't have a lot of time to spend on this, and I have a document that outlines some of this in greater detail. So to the extent people would like that, I'm happy to distribute it after this, this uh, call. Um, but briefly, at this point, 35 states are requiring or recommending that plans focus on this. And that can take the form of job counseling, requiring full-time supportive housing specialists, linking homeless to services, um, in addition, uh, 13 states are tying their performance improvement programs and patient initiatives, payment initiatives to social determinants of health, as well as to value-based designs. And last, and most recently, CMS came out with proposed regulations that expands the ability to provide non-healthcare related services to the chronically ill so the federal government is starting to think about what role do these types of programs and services, um, how are they deployed to meet the needs of the population? You know, uh, real quick, so Sherry, just to take a note, maybe we'll grab Sarah's document, include it in the show notes when we distribute that so everyone can get a copy of that. Uh, thanks, Sarah, for that offer. That's awesome. Sure. Uh, so I just want to, before we close up, I want to bring in Amy. Uh, Amy, from your perspective, give us a little bit of high level where some of the things that maybe we're grouped with. Sure. Um, I've been really focused on the social determinant of health that's kind of hidden in, but in plain sight. Um, and that is the gap of uh, healthcare assuming that every patient is connected digitally 24 seven with a smartphone and a data plan and uh, Wi-Fi and the internet at home that they can use with remote monitoring and all. Um, in fact, in Cleveland where I live, um, 51%, 52% of low income patients have no internet access at all. Um, many particularly low income patients may have smartphones, but they don't have data plans and they don't have the skills 
um, to confidently surf the internet, you know, to find the information you want them to find, to follow up on referrals and the like. So um, I'm really encouraging people to add to those screening questionnaires when they screen people for social determinants to find out um, what are patients' digital connectivity uh, and skills. And then um, I think a bit later I can talk about some of the strategies we're using to address that um, hidden, hidden in plain sight gap. Thank you. That's, that's great. So uh, let, let's um, let's briefly touch upon how uh, organizations could get started if they haven't really formally started a program uh, tied to SDOH and or they're just in the beginning. I want to give some folks some ideas uh, on some sort of low, the low lying fruit early win. So Sarah, I'm going to bring you back in and, and, and Zev, you'll be on deck. How do you get started? Sure. So uh, we need to start somewhere. Um, and ideally, it's a integration of data between the plans, the providers, and the other services that are required. But that takes a lot of time. For example, there is an organization here in Minneapolis uh, that actually provides lift rides to patients who may need help with non-emergent services um, like prenatal care. The interesting thing then is that those individuals, the service is deployed through the EMR and you can actually get data on whether or not it was completed by going into the EMR and seeing if that patient actually got the visit. But that type of integration takes a tremendous amount of time. Um, we've worked with plans here that don't have access to rich data. So we can take a small amount of data and start to make an impact on being able to access those services. Um, we can get limited enrollee data. And then there is uh, such a breadth of public sources to layer on top of it that such that you make a very rich data set with a small amount of information. You can use things like CDC indicators, county health rankings, social vulnerability indices, um, and others. I'm happy to provide that as well. A list I was of just going to ask, is there a place yes. where that's all centralized? Do you guys have that? All right. I can, Sherry, we'll, I we'll grab that from the show notes. Sherry, you're going to have an easy job today. It's basically Sarah doing everything. Thank you. I appreciate yeah, it. Absolutely. Uh, Zev, how about, how, how, what are some suggestions for you from you? Yeah, so, you know, the first thing is, as I mentioned before, you have to identify uh, which patients have what um, challenges around the social determinants of health, whether they be around housing, uh, food insecurity, safety, um, transportation, again, the ability to pay for medications, those sorts of things. So you, that's the first step. But that's clearly not good enough because you have to actually then act on it. And so one of the challenges has been, and this has been for years, and, and those of you who are in healthcare, you'll know this as well as I do, but for years, when we've identified social determinants of health uh, gaps or challenges, you have uh, typically a caseworker, a social worker with a folder with pieces of paper in the folder. And those pieces of paper are information, phone numbers for social services. And they haven't been updated. Um, and you know they're kind of a mess. They're put together by the individuals themselves typically. And you know, they'll scribble down a number and hand it to the patient. And that's the way it's been for quite some time. What's really exciting now is that there are electronic uh, databases and services. We happen to use one called Ambertha, there are others. And so what they do is they actually have an updated uh, service. So you literally, I could go right now onto Ambertha here, which was what we use. I can put in any zip code I want and what will pop up is all the social services in the community in that zip code. So it's electronic, it's updated, it's public. So I could be sitting with a patient and it could be the physician, it could be the care manager, it could be the nurse, it could be the patient themselves that's referred to the site. And, and I, could, I could sit with them. And in fact, I was talking to a physician yesterday who basically says the way they do it is they literally ask the, the patient to pull out their smartphone if they have it, they'll get them on the site and they'll actually connect them directly to these social services. If, uh, as Amy was saying, the patient doesn't have a phone or smartphone or internet access, um, the, the provider, the nurse, the care manager could actually do this for the patient. And again, there's a form, a HIPAA form that's signed, there's consent given uh, by the patient, of course, to do this. 
but uh, we could sit there and say, okay, look, we'll do this for you online right now. We'll get you connected to that social service in your community, whether again, it's around transportation or food or whatnot. Um, or you could just, again, give the patient the number and say, look, here's a service, here's the number. The, the advantage is not, not just that it's updated and it's, it's electronic and you can do it for the patient or have them do it themselves online. The advantage is also it's an electronic database. So it actually will keep that information and it will actually track that information. So if you want to go back and see, did the patient access that? Are they, you know, it sort of closes the loop. And so th these, these are really, really phenomenal. I mean, these are mind blowing advances in, in not only identifying social determinants of health, but actually doing something about them. And so th those are the two things I think that are essential if you want to get going in this. Uh, Eric, let me just jump in here and, and expand on that just a little bit. Um, so I completely agree on the notion to have that uh, collection of data and it's something that the industry has not had. Um, in addition, what we found is one of the most difficult is getting data on the members or consumers. And unless you have that, it is, um, all of this is perfunctory. So for us, uh, trying to find that and having the capability to do that has really been the starting point and then availing uh, the consumers or members to the additional services that were just discussed. And you can really drive a profound and positive change through that with the correct data. So I'm going to now shift. I want to provide the group. By the way, incidentally, those in the audience, I know we're tight on time. There is a Q&A module. Some of you have found it. If there's something you want me to follow up on with one of our panelists, uh, throw it in there. I'll do the best I can while trying to keep us on time to, to ask those follow-up questions. Uh, so very quickly, uh, I want to move into... Um, examples. I want the group now to hear examples from all of you. So Amy, how are organizations actually integrating S2H into their process so that there's actually an impact, you know, with engagement? Sure. So um, I'll, I'll just mention a few things that we're doing in Cleveland. Um, one is we're developing a virtual reality simulation for physicians to really be immersed in neighborhoods and understand uh, what the um, uh, realities of the lives of patients are to increase the empathy of providers and understanding of how social determinants of health really affect their, their, uh, their care and ability to um, uh, manage their own chronic conditions. Um, secondly, a lot of our work is focused on uh, patient engagement through digital connectivity. Um, the patient portals to electronic health records, I think, are the greatest population health tool ever invented. Um, they are widely underutilized, um, but patients really need some help in using them. Um, uh, Zev, I think, had mentioned that, well, the doctor will try to connect the patient to Aunt Bertha, and if the patient you know, can't do it on their smartphone, they bring in the care manager. There's a third, a middle way, and that is we have community health workers who are helping patients to, to bridge that gap, making sure that patients are getting access to low-cost internet services and free and low-cost um, smartphones, um, and then crucially training them how to use those tools. So those patient portals are collecting data on every interaction the patient has with them. And, um, you know, you can connect the social determinants of health in there as well. So I think you get kind of a triple whammy out of getting patients um, involved uh, in those in those portals. Every community virtually has local digital inclusion advocates that I, we encourage healthcare to partner with um, so they can help you screen your patients and you know, give you a place to refer them for their digital gaps and to train them to use those portals and all. So those are some of our uh, initial strategies. Thanks, Amy. Gina, what about at UCSF? Yeah, sure. So um, some of the things that we've done are, um, one, first of all, we have, we have a big, um, we have about 100,000 patients in our ACO, Medicare, Medi-Cal, commercial. Um, one of the things we've really invested in is training our team on uh, patient engagement. So they are all trained in motivational interviewing techniques and 
um, behavioral activation therapy. Um, and then the other thing we really pay attention to, which hasn't come up here, is language. Um, I think as uh, all of us in any urban center have a, a variety of languages and we always default to most everything in English. So we've made a concerted effort at significant expense to um, include uh, language, uh, not just interpreters, but anything that we do um, is, we're very inclusive of the bulk of the languages that we serve in San Francisco, which is a lot. So for example, we have a, um, a care transitions outreach program we call every patient after discharge and we're a tertiary quaternary academic center so the patients are, are very ill and and there are diaspora all over northern northern and central california so oftentimes the phone becomes your only link uh, with the patient so um, we have some automated outreach and all of those are in um, in many languages and um, and what we found is uh, with that training of the team and then layering on top of it um, the fact that we're working with patients in their own language, we're able to reach, um, our reach rate for patients, even through an automated system, is about 75% where patients pick up the phone and answer because we coach the patients before they even leave the hospital. Uh, we just, we're proud of our new all-cause readmission rate is 9%, which is pretty spectacular at an academic medical center. Um, and we usually have to, our nurses work with uh, intervention on about 42% of those patients. So. Um, I think that is one of the social determinants that um, we can easily um, address. Uh, but it is, you know, I, I think one of the things we haven't talked about is the expense of these that are not typically yep. in a fee-service model. And so I think the value-based models allow you to invest in these, but um, most of us, I would say, in big health systems are not at a tipping point where the majority of our patient population are in value-based programs. So it, it's, um, it's, it's hard to do um, and, it, and it's expensive. And I think sometimes we have to think about, um, you know, where the healthcare dollar, you know, we're getting, we're getting into from healthcare into the totality of a person's life. And so how, where, is, where is healthcare's boundary um, to execute on all that, even in value-based programs, I think, um, I think we have to ask us, ourselves that question. I know that's getting off on another topic, but no, it's really important to me because I think yeah. if healthcare takes on the responsibility, and I'm not saying we should, but even taking it under value-based programs and investing in a lot of that infrastructure, um, you know, I, I'm I'm not sure that healthcare's complete job. I think we're we should be um, recognizing it, quantifying it, and as many of our big organizations do, um, investing in back into our community and being a voice in the community and working with our community partners. Uh, that, I went off yeah, on no, the That's a good point. Yeah. No, and a lot, of, a lot of the questions are tough. Obviously, we have to, money drives everything. We don't like talking about it, but it's all about the money, whether we're in a not-for-profit or a for-profit. And we'll, we'll try to get to that in the next couple of questions. It's a good point. Uh, two, two things, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump over um, to Zev in a moment with the same question, but uh, my production team uh, is reminding me that uh, we're actually using polls for the first time uh, this year. So you've probably a bunch of you've seen these polls popping up. Uh, we'll have a couple more questions popping up so we can get interactive with you the best that we can in this kind of format. Um, invite you to take it and we'll share the results in the show notes, you know, aggregate, of course, um, in the show notes. So you get a, get a chance to see some of the, and you're seeing them now, but we'll, we'll send out the results to in the show notes. So thanks for doing that. Uh, so Zev, when you and I were talking offline uh, around this question, uh, you had suggested you had some, uh, you wanted to talk a little bit about social isolationism and, and, and maybe a program that's not at your organization, but in another one that you think people should learn about because it's worth considering cloning. So I want to give you a chance to talk about that now. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, first of all, let me just go back to a comment that Amy made. I think that's really critically important is that we tend to focus so much of care within our four walls. And I think that, um, you know, uh, community health workers, uh, faith based nurses and, and faith based community health workers are really a, a sort of under recognized resource. And uh, I think we all should probably be doing more of that. So I, I we, we actually I would say that to Amy's point, the probably most of the social determinants of health work that is going on in our organization is probably outside uh, with our faith-based nurses, with our care managers in the field. And so, uh, so I completely agree with that. Um, you know, I think the, 
this issue of social, there's a lot of work that needs to happen. I think still probably from a social terms of health perspective, our number one issue that we identified through a, uh, a community health assessment a couple of years ago, and has actually been verified now by the number of uh, patients that are using these services uh, through our, our, our identification prepare tool and our, and our AMP Bertha tool, is this issue of food insecurity. And so, you know, you can talk a lot about a lot of things, but if you don't have food, um, you don't have the basics of housing and food and that sort of uh, security, nothing else really matters much. And so I, I just want to kind of make that point. Another major sort of ubiquitous and really completely unrecognized uh, epidemic in our country and actually internationally is this issue that you raised, uh, Eric, about social isolation. And, and it's, it's a hard thing to talk about. I think it's, it's probably very, very personal and it's very painful. It's sort of along the lines of talking about depression or anxiety or behavioral health, but maybe even, even um, more insidious than that. So some of the stats are, are startling. And, and uh, Vivek Murthy, the ex-surgeon general, has, has really made this a cause celebre. Other organizations are really focused on this, particularly when they're, um, when they're responsible for costs and outcomes. Um, and so when it really starts to matter to the organization themselves, when they're doing like Medicare Advantage products, you see organizations like that really focus on this issue of social, social isolation. So just a stat or two, just to bring this home, um, in, the, in the United States and the UK, where there's been a fair amount of research on this, um, they've discovered that uh, in those people who are over 75 years old, up to 50% are actually socially isolated. And that social isolation is not just a you know, mental health issue, it actually translates into outcomes and costs, and it can increase the cost of care literally by 10, 20, 30%, um, leading to hospitalizations, readmissions, et cetera. So, I, I think that it, it is a really critically important issue. Um, and so we are, um, in some sense, looking uh, across the country and figuring out what the best are doing in this domain. And uh, one example uh, that you alluded to, I think, comes from an organization called Care More, which is a, uh, an organization that provides care to the elderly. It's been around for over 20, 25 years out of California. And they have a program called the Togetherness Program, which I think is really amazing. And hold on a second, I'm just gonna click off on this call. And um, the Togetherness Program, what they do is they identify people in the community that uh, are socially isolated, and they do it through um, either through uh, questionnaires or surveys. And then what they do is they have one of their uh, team, and they have actually a division within Togetherness, Literally, all they do is they call the patient up once a week and they talk to them. It's not about the medical issues. It's not about the medications. It's purely around trying to, uh, to defeat the social isolation. And some of the stories are actually really upsetting. The fact that um, these people will call up and, um, and, and they'll literally be these togetherness counselors will be the only person, the older person as speaks to the entire week. Um, and so, uh, so anyway, so that's, that's one of the programs. They've actually extended it to be a volunteer program for the employees. So we are actually launching with one of our payers on a very, very similar project where we're actually going to identify people, our patients that actually have social isolation. We're going to start with the older patient, but it's not limited to the older patient. And then we're going to reach out to them at least once a week to begin to try to uh, uh, attack the social isolation issue, connect them to social services. We'll probably do a couple of other things as well. But um, I, I think it's a I think it's something that deters, de, de, de deserves a lot more attention than it's gotten in the past. And I think in terms of even the return on investment, it's huge. Um, so Eric, I can I just comment? Can I have a follow up comment to that? Yeah, with Zev? sure. Uh, so Zev, you I think you've hit the nail on the head, and that is actually we've built that as an analytic as one of the risk factors in our Medicare ACO population. And we have set up a, a friendly caller program. So we make a concerted effort as an intervention to reach out to those patients with non-clinical staff. They have a, a, a clear escalation protocol if they run into issues so that the, it can be translated to clinicians. But we feel that this is gonna have a huge impact on um, ED use in our um, uh, Medicare ACO population. So uh, we just started that, uh, more to come, and uh, we're, we're um, measuring that to see, you know, what kind of an impact that has. So we're well, excited I, about it. Well, Gina, I'd love to reach out to you because there aren't that many uh, organizations that I've discovered yet around the country that are doing that. So I applaud you for that and uh, definitely would like to compare notes. 
And can I mention that I think one of the most promising uh, technologies is with smart speakers. Um, we're developing a smart speaker app to protect uh, women from domestic violence, um, but I've certainly been seeing uh, examples of ways that people are using smart speakers to, you know, have daily check-ins with um, isolated people. Nice. So we'll, we'll add, um, we'll do some research on our end to get a couple of articles on care more. We'll include that in the show notes. Maybe Amy, if there's anything on the smart speakers, we'll get that in there too. Uh, but we'll try to do as much as we can. So people have some notes yeah, Eric, to follow Eric, up. I, you know, I just wanted to, you know, we talked about care more, but I just want to say there are others, organizations like Chen Med, like your health in Boston, where you are, that are doing very, very similar things. And it's just, you know, again, to underscore the point, if all these organizations that are accountable for care are responsible for outcomes and costs, if all of them are doing it, then the question is, why aren't we all doing it? Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, and they're doing things like Yora and ShedMed and, and, and CareMore. They're taking their waiting rooms and literally converting them into community centers. I mean, that's how important this is to them. And so I, I think this is a bell. And I, I really appreciate you for giving the airtime on this show uh, for this particular topic. It's so, so critically important. Great. Renee, we're going we're gonna to bring you in. Uh, you've been waiting patiently. I want, um, could you provide us, uh, start us off, I want to give the folks to start off around how to determine what data sets are most valuable to improving care and how to go about just identifying those. If, if you were going to sort of sit down at any of uh, your provider partners or any of the organizations that take on some of this risk, can you provide like a high level step-by-step -step beginning to that? And then we'll bring in Jean to talk a little bit what that she's doing at UCSF. Yeah, th thanks, Eric. And it's a uh, very out of character for me to sit here so quietly for so long. <laughs> so thanks for uh, um, for the question. Um, so, so when I think about what's the the most important data, it's the it's the data that provides a a multi-dimensional view of the um, of the community of the of the patient. Uh, so at Cigna, you know, we've we've come to this space um, on focusing on social determinants from a, a number of different directions. Personally, I've come at it from the uh, the ACO management perspective. And, and we know a lot about our customers, physicians, patients, um, based on, on utilization data, claims data, experiential data, working with our practices. So we take that data and we combine it then with public sources of data specific to social determinants, so census tract data, other data sources. We take that public data and the, the specific information around social burden we bring that information together, we have created a proprietary social disparities index that we, based on the, the multiple public sources of information, we've created this social disparities index for each and every one of our customers. We can then overlay um, the social disparities um, data on a geo map, and we can, at a census tract, identify customers who live within a high social disparities or highly burdened environment. Uh, we then couple that, you know, in a variety of different ways, we can couple that back with, with our own patient level data, our ACO data, and front load to our provider partners, their patients who have a high social disparities index. So that when where they're stratifying their, their outreach, um, when they're working on their own strategic approach to improving overall outcomes, they can zero in on social determinants as an independent variable to help manage those populations. Time permitting, I'll talk a bit more about a strategy that we have that, that actually incorporates that. And I'm sorry, your lips are moving, but I can't hear you. <laughs> it's always once. It's always once. I'm good for one show where I just don't press the mute button hard enough. Sorry about that. So Gina, I was saying, why don't, why don't we bring you in and talk a little bit about what's going on at UCSF in this vein? Sure. So um, one of the things that we made a concerted effort, which um, I already started with the fact that we capture social, social isolationism is we actually have eschewed, you know, typical risk models because I think at a population health level, they're great, but at a one-to-one -one patient level, they really don't give you many levers on how you're actually going to treat the patient. 
So we've built in for our Medicare ACO um, in analytics as best as we can, knowing that this isn't captured, but we have some NLP processing. There's a lot of rich data in the narratives that are hard to get at. Um, but we've built in some analytics for risk factors around um, advanced care planning. Does the patient have one? Falls risk, social isolation, depression, um, cognitive um, impairments. And we know in, in and, and of course, all the chronic diseases. And I think a lot of times in risk-based uh, algorithms, we focus on chronic disease because we know the, the natural outcomes and we have a lot of data to support you know, what's gonna happen, but it doesn't really give us levers to actually do something for the patient. So now with our Medicare population, each one of those determinants um, actually has interventions that our care managers do. So, um, and it also highlights, for example, and I think this gets to Zeb's point about physicians um, not kind of putting the two together. So for, I'll give you a very good example. We met with a physician who has uh, a, a husband and wife patient, um, Cantonese speaking uh, patients who were 99 and 98. Uh, and with that data, we were able to see there were a few ED admissions, there was cognitive, uh, there was cognitive decline. There was dementia. There was one fall. There was um, no advanced care planning for either of them. And so, when we were able to put that picture together to the physician, who, when we were showing them their his list of Medicare patients, he's like, "Oh, they're doing great because they come together to their appointments and they're very, and the way that they interact with the physician was the way that uh, the physician was determining their ability to cope." But when we showed him this data, it made it pretty clear that these patients were on a, on a, thin, a thin thread um, of not being able to manage, and pretty soon they were going to go over the edge. So our care management team addressed many of those uh, interventions. So we feel pretty strongly that that approach, like what can you actually do um, to help these patients prevent from high cost utilization and, and actually then prepare them for you know what is really going to happen um, and we really partner with the physicians there so i think there's a lot to learn about how you utilize that data operationally and real time a lot of times we want to talk about it at sort of the macro level but for me it has to get down to the the one-to-one -one level and how we can actually do something about it so that's one of the things we're doing here um we're doing a lot sure, of kind sure. of fun things Go ahead. This, is the, Go ahead. this is a fun space in healthcare right now Yeah, I feel like we're at we're at this. Um, it, we'll look back in history at the, this time period in healthcare, and I think there's this fundamental changes of how we're just slowly beginning to rethink things. Uh, Sarah, do you want to jump in? Do you have anything to add here? Uh, sure. So um, one of the things that we've really tried to focus on is how do you get individuals to take the action to actually access all of these programs and services that are being created. Without that, it's meaningless, like I've mentioned before. Um, in the industry, I've seen a lot of terms like engagement, um, which are clicks and open rates, but it's the action and being able to drive the action and measuring that, that is absolutely critical. So one of the things that we've really focused on is building that and deploying the adaptive technology to understand member habits to understand um, their attitudes and behavior change triggers and their values and to be able to dynamically adjust the segmentation around that. So if somebody is not responding, we can change that quickly, but at the same time doing it in a way that avoids abrasion. Um, it also enables a real reallocation of resources to maximize the ROI, which we can't forget is, is important in these programs. Um, so those beliefs and values are absolutely critical to take action. And I'll, I'll give you one brief example. Um, uh, this is more a contextual component that we can layer in. An individual, a woman, was giving, uh, given bus tickets for free through a program. Uh, the woman had three kids and dropped them off at daycare every day. The buses routinely run late and the social service program didn't actually realize that. And as people know on the call, when you run late at uh, picking your kids up from daycare, they typically charge you and it can be a quite hefty charge of $5 a minute per kid. So if that bus is running late, what happens? Well, that member 
actually that negates, that lateness negates all of their earnings for the day. And so these programs need to start building that in with this data to provide services that are meaningful and not ones that actually compromise some of what the member and consumer uh, is trying to achieve. That's great, that's a good segue. So let's talk now about ROI. Uh, Renee, I'm gonna bring you back in from a healthcare perspective, I think everyone will be interested to hear about how, you know, do you demonstrate a financial ROI on, on interventions around SDOH? Yeah, thanks, Eric. And, and when I think of ROI, I also think about sustainability. So much of the work that we do, the startup work, is based on, on grants, um, on foundations, on, on the, the, the kindness and generosity of folks. But that's not sustainable. So we really do need to be able to demonstrate the ROI um, Zev pointed out earlier that a minority of the impact to overall health outcomes is due to direct medical care, um, which means that um, when we are working with provider organizations to incentivize um, improvement in outcomes and overall value, if we're not focusing on things that happen beyond the four walls of the practice, we're missing 90% of the opportunity. Um, so, you know, I... I come to this space, the social determinant space, through my work in, in building and managing ACOs. And when we work with our, our provider organizations and working to identify opportunities, we run up against that 10%, 90% conundrum. So we need to better connect our acute care, our care that happens within four walls, with what happens out in the world where our patients and our customers live and, uh, uh, and work and, and play. And that really focuses heavily on social determinants, that we can um, have a favorable impact on social determinants, reduce the burdens, reduce the disparities, improve health outcomes. That translates into our value proposition within our ACO models, whether it be a shared savings or a risk model, translates back into savings, um, incentive um, rewards for providers, which creates an ROI. But what about Specifics. How, how are we at Cigna looking at this? So important to, to understand that Cigna as a health plan is largely focused on large self-insured um, employers. So we actually don't have big pots of money um, to, to allocate to interventions. We really have to generate um, and sell a positive ROI to our employers, our ASO clients who are actually paying the bills. And we do that. And our, our focus is through our ACO model. Um, community health workers have been mentioned already, and that is a, a, a really powerful tool, we believe, in connecting our ACO strategy with the already developed uh, and well-defined um, ROI financial model with focusing on social determinants. How do we do that? Well, in the standard ACO model, we rely heavily on embedded care coordinators, care coordination, typically happens within the practice, sometimes it's even telephonic call center care coordination. By leveraging community health workers and making them part of the care team within the ACO, aligned to the ACO, but being in and of the community, speaking the language, knowing the communities, knowing the services, can really zero in using the data that we've talked about earlier, identifying those, those hot spots, those, those high risk customers, um, and connecting the social services with the community needs back with their acute health care. Think of these as a community health workers as a, as a bridge between the community, the patient, and the, um, the ACO. Uh, do, we, do we have evidence that this approach is successful? We do lots of literature around improvement in health outcomes, around um, uh, improving uh, diabetes outcomes, lowering ER utilization, lowering inpatient utilization, data going back to 2004. Uh, what's unique here is putting this now into the acute care setting and making the community health worker part of the ACO. That ultimately gets to that, that improved outcomes, improved medical cost management, savings, and leveraging the payment mechanisms we've already built in ACOs. Great. Does anyone want to jump on that, ask a follow-up question, or expand upon that? Because it was really, it was really interesting. Sort of gets a little bit to where the the money needs to come from. 
Okay. I, this is great, guys. We have a few more minutes, so I'm going to take a couple of the audience questions. Uh, just looking here. Uh, I'll throw this out to any, I'll lob it out to anyone. Uh, what do you anticipate from a technology standpoint that will help stand up these innovative models to address SDOH? Anything? Anyone want to grab that? Sarah, do you want to take it first? I yeah, I can, I can take it a bit. Well, the industry is developing a lot of support to technology these days, um, and it, it really is recognizing the need for it. Um, CMS came out with an uh, interoperability program to help encourage uh, the exchange of data. Uh, they have also created the blue button so that there is a much more free exchange of data and to the extent that members want to provide access, they can assign that benefit to organizations. And they have also developed the FIRE API to really create an open infrastructure so that we're starting to share the data. Um, and then organizations are leveraging that to build technology, open APIs, so that they can start taking this data in and they're not uh, captive to what comes over on the necessarily the EMR, the roster file, and can start creating a much more robust profile of the member to address some of these issues. You know, this is Ev. You know, I think uh, Renee and Gina alluded to this. The idea that you know, in other industries, they can tell uh, before we know what we want to buy. Uh, through the use of predictive analytics and using other open source uh, or, or available data sources, um, uh, what they call you know customer relationship management tools, and so I think the idea of using that same technology, that predictive analytics, that machine learning to identify who has social determinants of health issues, and and even more than that, who's going to be running into trouble in the future. We actually have the technology to do that. It's just applying it for that purpose. And so I, I think that that's a huge step. It's already happening, as I think Renee alluded to, but I, I think more of that should be happening. Yeah, and, and to have to add on to that, it's, it's, it's identifying using the data, but then actually having effective interventions and Absolutely. effective people to do it. If we rely on our acute care health providers, we're, we're kind of going against our notion that we should all be practicing at the top of our license of their licenses. I actually really would rather not have a, you know, a board certified senior position um, working on connecting to, to social um, services. Uh, we've got experts in that. Physicians are, are not very good generally in this. Let's get the right people. So I, I agree with you and it's a whole it's a 360 view of this, having the right data and the right connections, the right people. And I would, I would add to focus on um, patient empowerment through the huge proliferation of apps and remote monitors and devices that's out there, but there's a big gap in the evidence base for them. And I think healthcare has been a little afraid of uh, getting into this space, but you know, patients are starting to solve their own health problems without healthcare. Um, so I think that's a good opportunity for healthcare to you know, encourage patient engagement using effective technology that the patient can use. Um, can I just make a comment? Um, so we, we're, we're kind of, I would say, midway using technology, but my, my, my real philosophy is that this technology only works if the trusted human that can help them when the technology only gets so far is there. And I agree with Renee that it doesn't need to be the physician, but if you want to engage a patient, um, the best engagement tool is having the physician say, I have this team who can work with you. And um, so having that, um, and that's how we partner here, because you, you can't be this nameless, faceless group of people cold calling patients right. to try and help them. So there is this underlying this whole part of patient engagement is that is trust. They have to trust the people that they're going to reveal their most intimate, you know, vulnerable moments to. And um, and the and technology is great, but I agree with um, with Amy that there isn't a lot of evidence that people stick to any of these apps. There's a real you'll see the evidence. There's about a two week uptake and then it drops off dramatically. If we can, and I think the tools need to be simple. So I think it, it in my opinion, the, the tools need to be into the home, but in a way that is more of the arm of the trusted human that you have in your healthcare delivery world 
that can connect with you and understand your data and can respond to you when you need to. And I'm not sure, I, someone had put on the, um, on the webinar chat here about a smartphone. I think that is a completely underutilized technology in healthcare that everybody uses, but we are just so in our infancy of being able to leverage that as, as healthcare providers for a lot of reasons, risk and the fact that we're just really slow to um, move into something where everyone else is using this tool for their daily life, but for healthcare, it seems to be a gigantic uh, barrier for some reason. So those are my, my comments. But at the end of the day, it's really about the human and the trust and the technology just enables that. I'm going to, uh, I, I totally agree. I, I really wish we could go on further, but I'm looking at the time and I want to be respectful to everyone's time. Uh, Thank you, everyone who took the time to join us. Thank you to our wonderful panel. Uh, this was one of my favorite sessions uh, uh, we ever put together, so I really appreciate it. Uh, we are going to run our next one on March 21st. We're going to continue with this conversation, but focus more on the provider's role and the challenges there, and maybe the upside around physician burnout as we integrate STOH into uh, our regular practice of care. So that'll be March 21st at 1 p.m. East Coast time. Uh, I also want to remind you that if you just if you just want more information on how to understand combined consumer behavior with marketing, healthcare expertise, and analytics, to check out Revel Health again, uh, we'll send the URL in the notes. But to R E V E L dash Health dot com. Thank you to the folks at Revel for uh, supporting us this month. Uh, again, thanks to the panel. Thanks to Sherry Rohit and the team for uh, doing all the hard work uh, behind the scenes. We'll see you guys next month. This was great. We'll get the recording out to everyone, too. Thank you very much, Bye, everybody. Everybody. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Nice meeting you all. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye. And Jeff, take the survey, everyone. Take the survey. Okay, bye. Bye-bye.